Scientists have been warning about the climate crisis for decades, and the evolution of who they talk to and how they talk about science has changed during this time. Some psychologists have suggested that the way we talk about the climate crisis, using catastrophic terms like sea level rise and polar bears dying, could distance folks from engaging in climate action, because it's just too much for our monkey brains to handle. On the other hand, we've seen more people engaging in truth-telling and leading protests against the corporate and colonial greed that got us into this mess in the first place. Because let's be honest, a crisis is catastrophic. But more and more people are rising up to tell the uncomfortable truths around what's causing this crisis, who is responsible, who is most affected, what's the science behind it, and most importantly, how we're going to fix it. So while scientists play an important role in providing first-hand evidence that informs how we respond to this pivotal moment, everyone has a part to play in how we communicate around this issue. But is there a right way to talk about climate science and the climate crisis, when it seems there are multiple ways to do it? What is it about great science communicators like Ms. Frizzle, Bill Nye, Dad Ward, or the slew of sci-commers on social media that get people interested in learning more. In today's episode of the BMSC Climate Action Series, we're going to break down some of the myths around science communication, learn how to meaningfully engage in difficult conversations, and inspire you to think about how you can combine your interests as you engage in the dynamic world of science communication and climate action in your own life. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us live today for episode three of the BMSE Climate Action Series. It's exciting to have an episode on science communication and climate action because in the social media world, it's SciComm September and next week in Canada is Science Literacy Week. We have two amazing guests with us today, so I'd love to introduce you to our first guest, Dr. Dave Riddell from Ocean Networks Canada. Dave has more than 20 years experience as an educator in a wide range of contexts, as an in-service teacher, university instructor, and documentary filmmaker. In his role in the Learning and Community Engagement Department at ONC, Dave supports the teaching and learning of marine and environmental science in universities, colleges, and communities by designing and delivering courses and field programs center out, centered around data from ONC's underwater observatories and mobile sensors. His research background is in ecotoxicology, incorporated community-based research in addressing local environmental problems. Dave's work is trauma-informed and embraces critical pedagogy, open education, and transformative praxis. Welcome, Dave. Please go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you, Aneri. Uh, it's great to be part of this series. And uh, thank you to everyone who's been able to join us today. Uh, just bear with me while I make the switch here. Okay. All right, so I'm coming to you today from the University of Victoria. Uh, where we acknowledge and respect the Lekongan peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands, and the Songkees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. In talking about um, science communication and climate action, it's helpful to have a framework on which we can uh, hang all of these different ideas. 
And the one I want to use today is the change process model by Dave Pollard. Uh, Dave lives here in British Columbia on Bowen Island, and he writes on change and community transition. And for many years now, he's uh, run a website called howtosavetheworld.ca, and I do recommend that you check that out. So starting with the first point then, um, is the person aware of the relevant information? Um, because if they're not, then they're not ready to change. And it's our role then as communicators to uh, provide that information in an understandable and actionable way. Uh, and on its own, this, this first little part of the model, this speaks to the, the information deficit model of, of science communication. And this assumes that the public is uh, merely uh, undereducated or uneducated about a topic. And that our role as communicators then is to provide uh, those facts that bridge that knowledge gap. And that then translates uh, perhaps into a change in attitudes or behaviors. Now, this approach is helpful um, when you're already working with uh, an audience that um, is already genuinely seeking uh, science-based evidence on a topic of interest. Where this can backfire though, is if you're working with individuals or groups that are already deeply entrenched in uh, opposing views or have a distrust of the scientific community. And then this approach on its own is not going to be uh, very effective. So in terms of, of what we do as communicators um, also, well, we don't just communicate the facts, but we also have to uh, address some of the, uh, the misconceptions or misunderstandings that people might bring to a conversation as well. Um, I'm not going to spend uh, really too much time on this, except to mention that um, uh, uh, Banfield uh, Marine Science Centre is having uh, another session in this series in March that speaks directly to this. Uh, but this is one approach that you might take, and this is from the, the debunking handbook, uh, the current edition from 2020. So starting off with a fact, um, but then also working to address the myth, the myth, the misunderstanding that people might have, addressing the underlying fallacy for that misunderstanding, and then restating the fact um, at the end. So we, we, want, we want to move away from this idea that um, the conversations we have with people, uh, the learners in a, in a pedagogical context, are these empty vessels that are just waiting to be filled uh, with the knowledge that, that we might provide. And we want to move away from that deficit model to a contextual model. So an understanding that everyone comes to a conversation um, with their own life experiences. And those life experiences are going to shape how they receive, how they interpret, and ultimately how they act on or don't act on uh, the information that they access. So the next step then is, is the information consistent with the person's existing frames? So does it kind of fit with their, their schemas, their, their worldview, uh, their values? Um, if it doesn't, then they're not ready to change. And this is something that uh, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe talks about uh, quite often, uh, focusing on uh, searching for a common ground, this idea of, of, of shared values as a starting point for those conversations. And the example she often uses is that of uh, her conversations with her own husband around climate change, uh, where you know initially he was quite ambivalent uh, to, to taking action, but then reflecting on his own values and talking about his values and the things that he held important in his own life, one of those things was you know, being able to participate in winter sports right, and how those might then uh, be impacted by a changing climate. So using values as your starting point. Um, you will find yourself in situations where people's worldviews are challenging, uh, to say the least. Uh, in those situations, it's perhaps best to step away from that conversation or to have an entirely different conversation altogether. Uh, so the Summix uh, research in the last few years looking at resistance to um, taking action on environmental issues, like whether it be climate change or even something like recycling. And uh, certain people hold the view that uh, these kinds of activities are unmasculine, they're unmanly. So this quote from uh, 2014 uh, from a paper by uh, Anselma and Holtman, uh, for climate skeptics, it was not the environment that was threatened, it was a certain kind of modern industrial society built and dominated by their form of masculinity. And this isn't unique to uh, action on environmental issues. Uh, we've often seen a, a version of this uh, so in the last year and a half with the pandemic and the wearing of masks. And again, a paper from last year, 
Uh, men more than women agree that wearing a face covering is shameful, not cool, a stigma uh, or a sign of weakness. And Farai Chidea uh, invites us to reflect on these worldviews. So know where our frameworks and our ideas come from historically and culturally. Um, to better understand not just our audiences, but also ourselves. And social scientists are quite familiar with this approach, especially those that work in community or do any kind of uh, um, participatory research. And it's important that we kind of turn this critical lens on ourselves as well um, as communicators, uh, because our own worldviews are going to potentially influence uh, how we share a message with our audience um, and also the, the, the kind of narrative that we want to create uh, at the beginning. So here I'm talking about positionality, right? This is the social and political context that creates your identity in terms of race, class, gender, and so on. So there are some important questions we should be comfortable asking ourselves um, here. So one example would be, how am I as a member of a group or part of a system positioned? Uh, do I possess power? earned through individual efforts or conferred by others because of my perceived membership in a group. So for example, uh, scientists have a certain status in society and with that status comes power. And uh, it's more complex than that, of course, because we've got these intersecting identities and that can add to or subtract from that power. But there is a certain level of status there. It's the same is true for uh, educators as well. We have a certain level of status and therefore power. So how might this power foster a view of interaction with and pursuit of scientific knowledge that may differ from the standpoint of someone with differing power? So some additional questions to ask then in terms of um, communicating climate action. How and by whom is the action being defined? What principles and assumptions underpin those suggested actions? And are limitations and exclusions acknowledged and understood? So who is part of those conversations or, or who, who is not present as part of those conversations? Who can access those conversations? And another tool we might want to use here um, is the, this one example here. This is the power flower. This has been developed by Canadian social change educators uh, when working with groups to identify who we are and who we aren't as individuals and as a group in relation to those who wield power. Uh, so we have different contexts here in the center of the flower and then around the outside, uh, these petals, the outer petals describe uh, the dominant or uh, more powerful uh, identities in society. And this is a tool that we can use ourselves to reflect on where our power might lie or, or not lie. Uh, you can do this with colleagues as well. They can do this for you. So you get uh, an insight into how you, uh, you see yourself and how you might see, be seen by an audience, for example and what that means in terms of your relationship and, and, and message delivery. Uh, Dr. D.L. Sturt takes us a little bit further, asking, uh, asking some of these questions. So diversity asks, who is in the room? Equity responds, who is trying to get in the room but can't? Or whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure? So it's important as communicators uh, in whatever space we're working in, especially in a physical space, that we try and address those partici uh, uh, participation barriers and do what we can uh, to mitigate those. So for example, if you're giving a public talk, uh, can you provide interpreters for those people that need them? Uh, childcare for those with young families who would otherwise not be able to attend. Uh, transportation, can you subsidize that somehow? Can you pay for bus tickets for people on transit? Or can you cover the cost of parking for those that are coming by car? Um, have your events uh, multiple times and vary those times. So if you're visiting a uh, community, giving a public talk uh, and then leaving again, is it possible to stay a little bit longer and perhaps give another session, you know, in, in the morning or the afternoon as well as one in the evening or staying overnight and then, you know, giving a session in the evening, giving another session the following morning. So again, trying to maximize the, the ability for people to participate uh, in those conversations. And then finally, holding meetings in places where people feel comfortable. Uh, if you're in a smaller community, uh, they will often have a community hall. If that's not possible, perhaps meeting in a school is fine. But understand that not everybody is comfortable uh, meeting uh, or being in a school environment. And then when we do talk uh, to our audience, the, the language that we use is also key. 
And uh, the example on this slide and the following slide are from uh, transcribed conversations that took place between scientists and, and community members uh, a few years ago in, in Alaska, um, Nunavut, and Greenland. And the conversation here was about sea ice. And the first slide here we have from the transcribed uh, conversations, the word clouds reflect the frequency of, of, of the words that were used in those conversations. And this first slide is for the scientists. So you can see here the, the dominant words here were thickness, measurement, surface model, data, right? And then on the same topic, the, the other side of the conversation, then we see the word cloud for the community members. Here talking about sea ice, talking about time, dogs, food, clothing, meat, father, so those generational connections. So these are examples where your, your choice of language can end up uh, maybe creating a barrier or, a, you know, at the very least not being helpful in, in building those relationships between yourself and, and the other people that you're, you're speaking with or have, having conversations with. Now, I'm not suggesting at all that we want to kind of fake our connection to these life experiences, not at all. Um, but we can start again from a point of shared values and use conversational language. So for me, like I didn't grow up in the Arctic, uh, but I grew up in the Sparrens in, in Northern Ireland. And in itself, I mean, that is a very kind of open, expansive, kind of magical landscape. So I, I can start my conversations there with my connection to place and the people there and use that as a starting point uh, for a conversation that continues. So is the information consistent with the person's frames? If so, then ready to change. So change isn't taking place yet, but you know, people are able to map this new information onto their existing worldview. And as communicators, we can help do that with the use uh, of narratives. Now, narratives are very common and have been very common in the health sciences for many years now. So increasing um, uh, vaccine uptake, for example, or getting people to stop smoking. Uh, not as common yet in the natural sciences, but their use is certainly increasing. Uh, this is one example from 2018, uh, communication principles for IPCC uh, authors. Uh, and here these examples talk uh, to some of the things I've already mentioned. So being a confident communicator, talking about the real world, not abstract ideas or using conversational language, connecting with what matters uh, to your audience. So again, using values as a starting point. But then number four, telling a human story. So make it personable, uh, something that people can identify with, examples in their own lives, perhaps. And for climate stories, um, there's a lot of, of kind of powerful emotional content there. So this quote from Kaiser and Lovebrand, climate stories offer a powerful account of worry, sorrow, hope, connectivity, solidarity, agency. Uh, they talk to the loss of cultural traditions, protest against fossil fuel extraction, frustration with a lack of political action, and so on. So a lot of emotional content, and that's key to making a good, a good narrative. And these are some examples of um, paradigms for, for science stories. So if, if you're delivering information in this way, you have no kind of change of emotional tone, then you're not telling a story, you're simply presenting data. And that might be okay for some audiences, but um, if you want to engage people, you need to make it more personal, something that they can identify with. And uh, emotions are universal. So try and use that in, in the story that you're telling. So we have some examples here, uh, discovery, rescue, and mystery. So discovery here, we might be starting off and uh, you know, things are going well. Oh, you face a challenge, which you then overcome. Oh, you face a second challenge, but then you end on a high note. Um, so perhaps this is your, your graduate thesis, maybe, who knows? And then these last two are kind of, you're zooming into a subset of the discovery paradigm. So something like this. So rescue might be, um, you know, you're out for a hike, and you're walking close to a cliff edge and, and the cliff crumbles and, and you tumble down and break your leg. Oh no, but you get rescued and you get a chance to go in a helicopter and it was awesome and you got a story to tell. Uh, or mystery. You're starting off at a lower point here. So um, maybe it's like, ooh, I don't think I should go into that cabin in the woods. Oh, but I did, and it's okay. Oh, no, it's not. And then you've got uh, maybe a happy ending, uh, not quite so common in modern horror stories, but you get the idea, right? This change in emotional tone. 
and other components of a narrative that are really essential. And there's lots to say on this, um, but uh, kind of four major components to any, any story. First of all is passion. So some kind of, again, emotional hook uh, that your audience can connect with and stay engaged and want to hear more. Um, that might be sometimes challenging for, for some of the content you want to present. If that's the case, then your own passion as a storyteller can come through. Um, so they'll want to hear more just because it's you delivering the story. How are you going to tell that story? Uh, then uh, number two is the protagonist. So from whose point of view is the story being told? Is it yours? Is it your own experience? Um, is it the story of someone else perhaps in your audience uh, with their permission, of course? Uh, or is it an entirely fictional account that you're delivering? Uh, number three then is uh, an antagonist. So uh, perhaps another individual in the story or more generally, it's a, it's a challenge that needs to be overcome. And then number four is transformation. So does the story have the power to change the life of the audience in a meaningful way? And is that transformation positive? So it is transformative. So the, at the end of the story, uh, the protagonist is looking back on what has come before and can't imagine their lives to be the same again. Something has changed significantly. They're looking at uh, their, their life now with different eyes. And uh, just returning to these paradigms briefly, you'll notice that all of these examples, other than you know, the first one, uh, they all end on a high note. And that is key for um, climate change action stories. We need to give people hope. Um, because if you don't have hope, you don't think you have agency, then why would you take action? Um, I do want to spend just a couple of minutes just talking about hope because it's a, it's a small word that carries a lot of weight and we use it a lot when we talk about climate action and uh, especially in environmental education uh, more generally. And uh, sometimes I feel that it's, it's used almost as a kind of get out of jail free card or um, it kind of, it's a nice way to end a talk that otherwise has been filled with doom and gloom. You know, we gotta have hope. Yeah, we do. Um, but I feel that term isn't really used in the same way or maybe even appropriately sometimes. So I want to kind of briefly look at, at this. This is uh, from a paper by Jeffrey Duncan Andrade uh, from 2009. It's entitled, uh, Note to Educators, Hope Required When Growing Roses in Concrete. And uh, Jeffrey looks at uh, the, the concept of hope in a classroom, so the relationship between an educator and their students. Uh, but I think there are lessons here that can be applied to uh, communicating uh, climate action. So applying these, these examples then to climate action, hokey hope would be uh, the blind optimism that ignores inequities. So this idea then that you know, everybody can take action on climate change. Yep, but not everybody has the same opportunities to do so. There are other things that are happening in their lives that might prevent them from doing that, or other structural oppressions that might prevent them from doing that. So hokey hope ignores that. Uh, mythical hope. This celebrates the exceptions that may not be indicative of the trajectory that we are on. Um, so absolutely, we should celebrate uh, the wins that we have and the good news stories. Um, but are they, are they indicative of our path? Uh, we can't just pin all of our hope on, on mythical hope. We need to work beyond that. We need to keep doing the work. Uh, hope deferred. So this refers to solutions that require tools or resources that are not currently at hand. So one example here would be, uh, you know, technology that has not yet been invented is going to save us. And that might be true, but what do we do in the meantime? Okay, it's not enough. We can't, again, just focus on something in the future to save us. We need to do something now. So critical hope then, the enemies of hopelessness, uh, it's much more active than the, the, the passive uh, enemies of hope over here. So material hope is in direct contrast to hope deferred. So here we have resources uh, for change are already available and accessible, so they can be used right now. Socratic hope then, an examined life may pave the path to change. So here we were talking about turning that critical lens on ourselves and being honest with ourselves about how we can get out of our own way and the way of others uh, to move the work forward. And then finally, audacious hope. And this demands that we reconnect to each other and struggle alongside one another, sharing in the victories and the pain in the process of change. 
And uh, so this is then talking about um, the being able to acknowledge and, if possible, communicate the, the, the environmental grief that we feel and sharing that with others. And uh, despite that, still working together to move uh, things forward, to make progress. And this quote then from Greta, the one thing we need more than hope is action. Once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So back to our model, ready to change. Is the change perceived as urgent? So there's no choice but to change now. If so, then the change process can begin. And this may loop back into uh, the start of the process again, if you know, the change is multi-step or complex. Uh, if the change is not perceived as urgent, perhaps it's perceived as important. So it's something like, I, I, I need to do this, but I can't do it right now. Something is preventing me from doing it. Then we're moving into step four. Does the person have the time or energy after dealing with the needs of the moment? Because if they don't, then they're going to defer change. And this is something that Paul Hawken uh, talks about uh, in this quote. Overwhelmingly, most people wake up and immediately focus on their current needs, not future existential threats. How can someone get engaged on climate when they can't get a job or properly feed their family or have access to health care education and personal safety. And so, so Paul is placing us in the context that um, any action on climate change must go hand in hand uh, with action on social issues to provide the ability for people to take action. So how can we help do this? Connect people with others who are already making the change, offering tools, models, and means to make it easier. So sharing the load. As individuals, we don't have to light up the whole world. Um, it's enough that we light up our corner of it and, and get help doing it, right? We support the people that are already doing the work. So is the change fun to make or do? Because again, if it's not, you're going to defer change. So you might, after all of the other needs of the day are met, it's like, okay, it's the evening. I got to go do the thing. Ugh, but the thing is a real slog. Uh, so you're not going to do the thing. You're going to find excuses to not do the thing. So making it uh, fun to make or do, uh, then you'll move the change process forward. So here we want to connect people once again with others who are making change, offering tools, models, and rewards to make it fun. And then the change process can continue. So um, one way of doing that, of course, is, is, is in a collaborative environment, a teamwork environment. Again, you're sharing the load, you're sharing the stories, having a laugh along the way, hopefully. Another way to make change uh, fun is by rewarding it. So making a game of it, providing prizes or recognition or enjoyable tools to do the work. And uh, we tend to rely too much on people's uh, altruism and to underuse rewards to encourage uh, environmental responsibility. So that's something else to reflect on. Uh, so I just want to uh, end on this slide. It's a, a cartoon uh, from Joel Pett. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this before. Uh, I, I love it. I love how it uh, articulates well all of the benefits that society can gain uh, from appropriate action on climate change. But I also want to just have a quick look at this. So creating a better world. And again, that critical lens. So uh, creating a better world for, for whom? And uh, so just in closing, just to summarize, that we want to make sure that our conversations and actions related to climate change are paired with conversations and actions related to social justice. So who is included or excluded in those conversations, actively working to remove those participation barriers? Asking the question like who is making decisions and defining the actions to take, being inclusive as we can, so that the benefits of climate action can ultimately be experienced by everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. That was a wonderful presentation. You, you couldn't see me, but I was snapping my fingers throughout so many great points. And a great segue into how can you make this fun and engaging is actually our second guest for today. And I'm sure we'll have tons of questions for you in the Q&A. 
So our second guest for today is Maynard Okereke, otherwise known as Hip Hop MD, creator of the Hip Hop Science Show. Maynard graduated from the University of Washington with a degree in civil engineering and is an award-winning science communicator, having received both the Asteroid Award for Best Streaming Content and the People of Change Award for his community outreach efforts. Noticing a lack of minority involvement in the STEM fields, he created Hip Hop Science with the goal of encourage minor encouraging minorities and youth to pursue more advanced career paths. His background in engineering, acting, business, and the music industry as an artist make him uniquely qualified to engage on a wide variety of topics from an entertaining perspective. And if you've been following any of ONC's coverage on their Nautilus Live vessel, you'll probably seem familiar to you. Um, thanks so much for joining us, Maynard. Go ahead and start your presentation, please. Awesome. Can you hear me just fine? Cool. Very great. Awesome. Uh, I want to first say, Dave, that was an absolutely incredible presentation. Uh, it's always it's always great to be able to listen to uh, other amazing people doing work in science communication and really break it down from a unique perspective. So appreciate everything you brought. I'll have some questions for you later on. Um, but uh, with that being said, completely switching gears, new dynamic that I'm bringing to the table uh, because I'm not as qualified as Dave to be able to uh, articulate specifically what he touched on, but I will touch on it from my perspective and from what I do. Uh, but uh, great introduction. Uh, for those that don't know uh, or confused a little bit about exactly this hip hop science platform, uh, I'll kind of do a little breakdown first about who I am, how I got into the work that I'm doing now as a science communicator, just to give you a better framework. And uh, for my presentation, I really just want to kind of keep a little more. So I'm going to talk a little bit about science communication. Uh, how I got into the science communication fields, what's important about science communication. Uh, later on, when we start going to q and I have some connections that I want to make to some things that I'm doing in relation to climate change and conservation and wildlife, which I think are very appropriate to a lot of this discussion here uh, for this uh, panel. Uh, but so I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here. I'm not going to do too much screen sharing because I like to talk to the camera if you couldn't tell. So I'll probably be coming back here straight to camera. But I'm going to start off with a little intro and kind of showcase a little bit about my journey, how I got to to what I am now as the hip hop MD. So let me uh, make sure that this is sharing just fine and optimize for sound. Good, awesome. Uh, can you see my screen? Good to go. Perfect. All righty. So uh, Maynard Okereke, also known as the hip hop MD, for those that are familiar with my hip hop science platform. But if you're not, I kind of give you a little breakdown of my history and kind of how I got to where I'm at now. Uh, always wasn't into science communication, always wasn't an engineer. Uh, my passion was always in entertainment. I was a music artist, hip hop artist, uh, producer as well, uh, toured all across the country, worked with artists and in music myself. That was always something that I was always truly connected with. But I was always a nerd at heart. Uh, growing up, I used to explore, I used to enjoy wildlife, catching snakes, frogs, salamanders, I had this wildlife fat card that a mom, my, when my mom got me when I was in elementary school. And to this day, I can name off whatever random wildlife facts you probably don't even want to know. Uh, so I was always a nerd at heart. I ended up going to school uh, at University of Washington in Seattle and pursued a degree in civil environmental engineering. And I worked with the firm uh, Turner Construction for a while. We did a lot of heavy infrastructure projects, those condominiums, high rises, uh, data centers from Microsoft, Nintendo buildings, all sorts of projects. Uh, but as I was always an entertainer, uh, acting, being in front of camera was always my wheelhouse, something I always wanted to get back to. So after working in the industry for a number of years, I left and moved down to LA to pursue entertainment. I know a complete 180. It doesn't make any sense until I came to what it is that I do now as the hip hop MD with my hip hop science platform. I was able to merge all of my passions in music entertainment, acting, and science to now be able to do a lot of outreach work. For me, I noticed a gap, especially with diverse audiences, people that look like myself, having an interest into the STEM fields. And the whole goal of hip hop science was to make uh, science more tangible, make it a lot more relatable, something that people connect with. A lot of times you see these concepts and they go over your head and you think this doesn't relate to me. I wanted to be able to connect with my audiences and people that look like me from a very, very different perspective. So. Um, Kind of want to do it's it's going to seem a little strange but i think it kind of gives a good build up 
to a little bit of science communication work because even for me, um, and I'll just kind of stop sharing my screen real quick because I hate doing the slides and people are looking at me. Um, with me, science communication was something that I wasn't always familiar with. Right? as a science communicator platform. And I never looked at it or at it as science communication. I didn't even know that that was a field that people are now getting PhDs in and masters and all sorts of different things, right? I didn't know that that was even a lane that I could navigate. I knew about engineering. I knew about all these other STEM fields. I didn't know science communication was a thing. And it's been so cool going through this journey because you've been able to find out that people are communicating science in so many different ways through social media. I've connected with science communicators on all sorts of different levels. And uh, so I was, when I was going through this presentation, I was kind of thinking it was important to just kind of give a brief history about science communication, how we got to where we are. So I'm going to go through this, uh, this first kind of sphere uh, pretty quickly just to kind of blaze through. But I think it's kind of important to know. So if you missed what I was <laughs> talking about with ancient Greece, kind of talking about the origins, right? Looking at science from a very philosophical perspective, right? And, uh, you know, at Plato and Aristotle, and you had these ancient Greek figures, right? And science was something that we intrinsically wanted to know because we were curious about the world around us. And so you had all these philosophical methods about science. And then we steered into the dark ages, right? And science became very figurative and you had high illiteracy, right? There was not such more, it's not as much of a philosophical method, right? We talked about things like the bubonic plague and trying to come up with these weird home remedies to solve solutions and looking at things from like a God perspective of, you know, this, this other being came down and, and this is why we have these certain things happening. So there was a very kind of diminished era when we went, went to the dark ages, right? And then you get into this kind of renaissance period where you have this rebirth of text, right? And this new uh, rise of media and understanding how media affects and propaganda and all these different things. And I think it's important to kind of showcase that because it takes us to the present, where we're at now in science communication and why science communication is so important. Um, we're kind of past that philosophical method of kind of you know, had, you had one person just kind of thinking about these ideas and manifesting different things. Now science is a very teamwork effort, right? Uh, Dave showcased that in his uh, presentation, right? It takes teams to be able to make uh, all these different solutions that we have and to be able to bring a lot of these discussions about climate change and just environmental awareness and new technology to the forefront. It's a very, very vast difference because now we have uh, the sport of organizations and mass media to be able to influence a lot of the things that we do. And on top of that, we obviously have our communication platforms. Social media, obviously, is a huge platform. And that's kind of where I've been able to channel my science communication work is through social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, whatever it is that you enjoy the most. You find a way now to be able to bring that information to the masses. And it's so important because now, especially in this uh, era of so much miscommunication, the really important thing about science communicators is that it's our duty, it's our job to give the public that true information that they need. Uh, something that's huge right now, obviously, with the pandemic going on, there's always been a clash, right? Vax vaccinated, non-vaccinated. You have so much different science awareness going on because now things are so much more accessible. And that really changes our perspective and our understanding about the importance of science. But at the end of the day, science is all about discovery. Even as scientists, you're making new findings, uh, you're channeling new discoveries, and we're still wanting to know more. Nothing is ever concrete. Things change as we get more information. And that's the process of science. You go through the scientific method and you test things out. They work, they may not work. And then you go back again to that wheelhouse and try to uh, be able to find the source. So it's really important right now with this stage that we're in. And uh, let me go back to my slide here. So we have a really true responsibility as uh, science communicators now utilizing these platforms to not only give the public proper information, but also to draw excitement, spark curiosity. Uh, Dave mentioned this, especially when we're talking about things like climate change. There has to be a way that we communicate this information to the masses to be able to make that connection, because otherwise it's either going to go over our heads or we're going to feel like it doesn't speak to us or that it's not important enough for us to be able to participate in. And so there's a really, really unique importance. And I mentioned this earlier, the global pandemic, uh, getting that proper information to the uh, masses, but that also the evolution of science, right? Getting comfortable with this notion now that things change. Things aren't always uh, as they were, right? We're learning new things every single day about this pandemic. Well, you know, remember when it first started, we didn't know about masks and then became masks were a thing. And then it's like, oh, we know that there's always new things coming out and we can form as things develop and we get more information. 
So it's really important to really understand these platforms that are out there and the way we communicate and why this communication is so important. And uh, the last bit I want to get to, uh, because I really want to focus more so on Q&A and getting you guys a chance to ask questions about different things. Uh, but I think it's important to touch on it because this is something I try to do uh, with my platform. And uh, let me see here if I can still bring this up. Uh, but this is in kind of a relation to this dynamic that we're in right now, right? And social justice, we're talking about social justice and we're talking about diversity and inclusion when it comes to communicating science. And I think it's really important because there's such a push right now for diversity in science to have that representation because different cultures bring so many different things to the table. Uh, different ethnic backgrounds bring so many different things to the table. Genders, we all have something unique that we can develop and be able to now uh, be able to take science to a whole nother level. So it's important to always have that at the forefront when we're communicating science and when we're connecting with different audiences, because what we think here in the US is gonna be very much different than what they think in a different country. And, uh, and then what we think as males and females, transgender, all these different uh, communication forefronts are going to be much different depending on your background, depending on your exposure and what you've been around. And um, there's such an influence now with politics and racial injustice, this intersection now that we have to be able to deal with when it comes to communicating science. And so there's an added level of responsibility, our duty uh, to be able to take that kind of philosophical old school method that we had when we were really developing science communication and communication in general to now to this present day and see how that really affects everything from a global dynamic and from a cultural dynamic because there's so many other more bigger influences that impact where we are in this media stage uh, in life and, and as it relates to communication work. And um, so that's really what I wanted to focus on. I know there's gonna be a lot of questions and I really wanna be able to have a chance to kind of have some open dialogue back and forth. Obviously we're a uh, big focus here is on climate change and different things like that. And they, uh, I'll have some questions for Dave earlier. <laughs> I have so many questions, I'm sure everybody has it too. Uh, but he brought up a lot of different things. And one thing that he brought up too, uh, that I think was really important was uh, these different audiences that we're able to connect with. Um, I'm on the board of directors for Reserve a YLT and it's the first uh, fully youth funded nature reserve, right? And it's backed by youth. Um, and the whole focus is to be a youth run organization. And things like that are so key because as we're discussing about climate change, who's the one that's going to have to deal with these, right? It's gonna be our youth. It's gonna be everyone that's coming under me. And after that, that's going to have to deal with the ramifications of what we've done. And it's important that they're connected with that. And so even organizations like that, that I'm involved with are very, very important to me because I know that's gonna be the foundation for where we're able to take climate change and our understanding and our communication about the importance of climate change to audiences all across the globe. Uh, so I hope that gave a good perspective about my background, my kind of viewpoints of science communication, and uh, I like uh, I like all of, all of us to uh, kind of sum it up together and see uh, what other interesting viewpoints uh, every one of you has. So um, thank you. Thanks, Banner. That was awesome. So many great intersecting points with Dave's presentation as well, and so inspiring to hear your story as also a minority in STEM, it's one of the motivations in my work too. Um, so I guess we have a question for both of you and perhaps we'll start with Dave, but what motivates you in your work and what do you wanna see more of in the science communication and climate action work? Um, I think for me, um, one, one of the big motivators is um, just being able to, first of all, connect with people um, it's, it's one of the things, especially that's kind of come to the front again for me um, now that restrictions have been lifted a little around uh, the, the, the pandemic here. Uh, so last last Friday, uh, I, I'm a keener, so I, I was I was in the line to the, to vote early uh, in the election. So Friday morning and I was standing in the lineup and, uh, you know, while we were waiting to go in, you know, people are chatting to one another, you know, socially distanced, right, all, all the good stuff. But it was just, you could see the relief in people's faces just to have conversations again. And uh, I mean, social media can do that to a certain extent, uh, but the fact that we've been or felt so isolated now for the last year or so, um, those face-to-face -face conversations have been so important. And it's been great to just reconnect with folks and you know, even just on that lineup, just talking about you know, going in to vote for the election, like talking about what their, their hopes and their fears are for themselves and for, and for their families and their future. Uh, and 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 that's key. And, and I hope that 
we can we can maintain that and uh, that we can find avenues to stay connected no matter what happens over the next few months so that that's a big one for me thanks maynard did you also have a perspective on that question yeah can you repeat can you repeat again for me yeah totally so what keeps you motivated in your work and what do you want to see more of either with climate action or science communication yeah um for sure i think for me the thing that really keeps me motivated, and I kind of harped on it a little bit when I talked about uh, my work with organizations like Reserva, is seeing the interest that uh, not only our youth have, but others have uh, in continuing this work, right? Because there's always going to be a need, right? There's always going to be something that has to be done in the future. And I think that's what inspires me is knowing that we're going to pass on information that's critical for others to be able to take on and carry this mission on, especially when it comes to climate change. And for me, that's what keeps me motivated, making sure that we can continue to inspire our youth and also spark curiosity in our youth to be able to not only think about these concepts from a different perspective, but now be able to come up with tangible solutions. And there's so many different things happening with technology. Um, and it's it's an important wave right now because not only are we moving in this social media age, but we're moving in this technological age where not only app developments, but you have new devices and all sorts of different things that are going to really change the face and landscape of how we do things in general. And all of that's going to eventually have an impact on our climate and our environment. And so for me, it's kind of seeing that wave, seeing what's at the new forefront, but really who's going to kind of pass on the, the or carry that torch that we're passing on and really be able to take uh, this communication to another level. Thank you. And just a reminder to the audience, if you have questions, feel free to drop them right in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll relay those to our guests. And we actually do have an audience member who has a question. Um, Heidi, who's an educator, asks, how can we communicate the urgency of this situation without engendering despair or apathy? Um, Dave, do you want to start on that one again? Yeah, uh, that's yeah, that's a great question, um, and it's it's actually something that environmental educators have been talking about for a while, and and there's been kind of a a shift, kind of backwards and forwards on this over the last few years um, about whether we should be avoiding um, kind of negative messaging, and in, in, you know when we're trying to talk about <clears throat> taking action on environmental issues. Uh, my, my own take on this is that, yeah, I, I guess we do have to take a, a, a balanced approach, but um, the key thing here is when we talk about this, about this, we often talk about the fact that, you know, emotions like anger or, or fear, there's something inherently wrong with those. Um, and they can be problematic, but only if there's nowhere where they can go. So I think the key thing is that those emotions can be motivators as long as people have something that they connect with and can take action. So if people don't have a community they can connect with or there aren't resources that are available to them, then yes, that's a problem. Feeling anger or fear is going to be destructive. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's key for us as communicators, uh, like when we deliver these messages, to try and find out about the the audience that we're talking to and the community that we're speaking with and, and find out who or, or what we can connect them to in those communities so they can collaborate on that work. Because then, you know, we can, we can continue the work, we can, for, we can move that action forward. Otherwise, yeah, people feel stuck and we feel stuck too much. So we need to try and find ways to connect with each other and help each other out. Totally, and I love how you um, already touched on this in your presentation of what is hope actually and how does that manifest. Um, and Maynard, we have a question for you. Um, your journey is unique and very inspiring seeing how you're combining multiple interests. What, would you, what advice would you give to folks who are on their journey of self-discovery and, and discovering which talents or skills they want to invest in? Whenever you experienced doubt, what did you do? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, it's one of those things you you still experience it uh, even uh, uh, even later on, right? When you're doing this work right now, there's still times I doubt whether or not uh, I'm still skilled enough or belong in this space, right? Imposter syndrome was a very real thing that we all deal with at different stages, no matter how successful you can be. Um, it just kind of conforms and, and changes depending on your stage. Uh, but for me, I think the best advice, especially kind of the path that I've gone on, uh, having gone 180 degrees and going into a whole different space, 
um, is really is really finding something and, and trying new things, right? My whole big thing is curiosity is nature's PhD. Never stop asking, right? And every single thing that I've done uh, in my career is sparks from me just being curious and going in head first and trying new things and then adapting along the way. Uh, because it's, 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 it's very difficult, right, to know exactly where you're meant to be, right, until you try something, you're like, ah, I don't like doing that, right? And you have to kind of go through those ups and downs of getting yourself into a space and realizing that's not for me. And you never know what's not for you unless you try something. And so my whole big push is to always uh, test myself, test my barriers, test my limits, uh, and see where I can go. And even uh, like you mentioned, I just recently came back uh, from this uh, expedition with Ocean Exploration Trust and Ocean Networks Canada, uh, doing a month long expedition out at sea. And for me, there was always an intrinsic love, right? Early on watching Nat Geo and Discovery Channel and always wanted to be that person on a big research trip with a team of scientists and going to some, going to some you know, rainforest or some hidden location, right? And, and doing some deep seated scientific research. That was always something that was like, that's gotta be me sometime, right? Never knew exactly how I would go about doing that. And I've been doing this hip hop science platform for a while and somebody in my network uh, came about with the Nautilus Live opportunity and I got, uh, I got kind of caught up into watching some videos and seeing some of the work that they were doing. And I was like, that sounds awesome. I wonder if I could be a part of this fellowship, right? And I didn't know if my science communication work that I would do, was doing was going to be able to really translate to that opportunity. But I, I applied for this fellowship and they started following the platform and loved the work that I was doing, the outreach work that I was doing, and finding unique connections as far as uh, lack of diversity when it came to marine science. And I started connecting with like Blacks in marine science and showcasing representation in a field that wasn't traditionally open to us, right? And being able to now spark that curiosity and spark that ability that we can do it and we belong in that field. And so in that kind of way, it kind of goes back to what Dave answered when it came to apathy and the you know, emotions and different things like that, being able to now make a connection to something that you didn't feel involved with. And that's what it kind of took for me to be able to get to where I'm at now is trying new things and overcoming that kind of level of apathy of not knowing if it spoke to me or if it was meant for me or if I can be in it or if I was meant to be involved in it and testing those waters and then seeing what came out of it. Awesome. We love it. Curiosity is key. Um, and we have another question from an audience member. M asks, how do we encourage people to move beyond individual actions and push for collective action and large scale changes. And both of you allude to the social changes that are needed to accompany any sort of ecological climate action. Um, so what role do you think science communication plays in encouraging collective action? Um, Dave, let's start with you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, well, uh, we, we can't do this on our own. Um, it's 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 too it's too big of a task to do it on our own, um, and uh, as much as we'd want to, I mean, we're we're just going to burn out. Um, so we need the help of others. We we need to find a way to connect. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, like a lot of this work has to go hand in hand um, uh, with with other social work because um, we need to try and address those barriers so that we build the the, the mass of people that can help support this work and uh, you know, help people out of the other challenges that they're facing. And this is not simple work. Like it's, 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 it's exhausting and it's, um, it's, it's going to take a long time, but we, we can't do it alone. That's, that, I guess that's, that's the biggest message and finding people that can help support you either in the work itself or outside of the work itself, like outside of the, like the physical work, the, just helping share the mental load or the emotional load, mm. people that you can talk to, I mean, sharing your, 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 your kind of your climate grief, your, your environmental grief. Um, that's a huge thing too, because uh, that can stop people right on their tracks. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult work and we all need help with it. Absolutely. And I like how you touch on those different kinds of work that are in fact, climate action. How are we caring for other people? Um, we're going to have an episode later in November about mental health, eco anxiety, and talking a little bit about collective healing and collective grief and how those work together. Um, I do want to be mindful of the time. So we'll just ask Maynard if you have an opinion on this piece as well in terms of collective action when it comes to climate change and science communication. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
yeah, just like Dave mentioned, right? It's it has to be a group effort. There's no one person that's going to come up with this solution, uh, and no one or two people is going to take multiple teams uh, and and communities to be able to come together to be able to now be able to set some actionable change. Um, but it really starts at the end of the day. It really does start with the individual. It starts with those small groups, and I think especially now with social media and, and the work that I do now in science communication. I came into this kind of just doing my kind of wheelhouse. I had my hip hop science platform moving and I was just kind of doing the work, creating content, finding different opportunities to be able to engage with communities. But it wasn't until I really started to now kind of find that tribe and see other people that look like me that are doing this work in multiple different lanes, people with different backgrounds, medical degrees, people on the data side with technology, all sorts of different backgrounds, kind of coming together for this kind of unified uh, push to be able to create change. And, uh, you know, we started a group of us uh, started this uh, STEM success summit that we do every year now. This is, we're going into our third year of it, uh, where we really the focus is to be able to empower uh, young, diverse working professionals uh, that are either just getting into the field, coming out of college or currently working in their field and really trying to navigate and find their purpose uh, within their STEM fields. And we found that there was such a need for that. And through that community, we were able to now develop other different niches that were solving different problems when it came to uh, lack of, uh, of voices in tech, right? Or lack of diversity in uh, biology fields, or even like talking with like zookeepers and really kind of having this kind of disparity as far as uh, representation in these different fields. And then finding a way that we can now get more of those voices and find more inclusivity, right? And it stems from just building that community, making an impact, seeing what problems are going on in different areas. Because now you have so you realize that you have so many people in, in areas that can be affected by climate change or in other environmental issues or racial injustice issues that are connected with our environments, right? Whether it be like bad drinking water or low, low drinking water quality in different areas. Uh, and then finding ways to now be able to team and rally around each other to be able to find solutions for a lot of those problems. So it starts at a small level, building up that niche, finding those communities, seeing what problems, and then realizing that people that look like you, that are around you, that are doing the same work are also affected by that, and then joining forces and really starting to make waves. So it starts at a small level, but it comes down to making that uh, concerted effort as a team to now be able to make tangible change. Thank you. Wonderful answers from both of you. And I know there are still so many questions I have, but we're running out of time. So we're going to get to those in the podcast. So and if any of the audience members had questions that they didn't get answered today, please still put them in the Q&A and we'll try and catch Dave and Maynard for a phone call later this fall. Mm -hmm. um, and just wanted to end by saying we know this is a heavy conversation and may evoke some feelings of dread or apathy. And when you're trying to engage in conversations with people in your life and encountering deniers or that classic person on Facebook that you just roll your eyes, um, it's hard and it's hard to make ourselves vulnerable and feel like we need to say the right thing. But it's important that we at least try and just not let that fear of messing up stop us from engaging in those communities and engaging in science communication. So with that, we're going to end with our climate action recommendations today. And these are, again, at across different scales, starting at the individual and building across collective scales. So for our first recommendation, the next time that you want to roll your eyes and walk away from some kind of climate denial or climate distraction conversation, we want to encourage you to just take a moment to stop. Think a little bit about who is this person you're talking to? What's your stake in that relationship and your positionality? Do you have a certain level of privilege that you can use in that conversation? And are there any of the skills you learned today that you can apply? For example, can you engage in a values-based conversation? And our second recommendation is that we know that science communication happens in so many ways. And as Hip Hop MD has shown, you can combine really unique skills to engage in science communication, conservation, or climate action. And so we wanna hear from you. Tag us on social media. Let us know who some of your favorite science communicators are. And as Maynard recommended, keep that seed of curiosity going in your own journeys. And for our final one, as Dave mentioned, we have an election coming up. And although electoral politics aren't the only way of engaging in collective action, we're in a really timely place right now to use your vote, support candidates and parties that are climate champions and those that who have a track record of keeping with their commitments. 
Um, so keep an eye out for that. Make sure you're registered September 20th. Or if you're like Dave and you already voted, good for you. So keep an eye out on social media at BMSC Climate. We're going to have these recommendations up for you in one place. And the resources that Maynard and Dave talked about today will also make sure that those are linked in our show notes. With that, we'll see you next week. We have a quick turnaround for our next episode. So on September 22nd, we're going to be talking kelp forests, kelp forest restoration, and working with the BMSE live team here, just in time for Science Literacy Week. And registration is open and filling up fast for that. So that's it. Thanks so much to our guests and to all our audience members for coming today. We look forward to seeing you next time.